Hello and welcome to the second in our Raspberry Pi tricks and tips videos. We're continuing on with the Raspberry Pi router and we're now moving on to step two which is the installation of free range routing or FRR, the software that will turn your Raspberry Pi into a very capable little router. Now what I've done is the installation process is not trivial, let's say. Uh, it does take a little bit of understanding of Linux to get this to work. However, I will go through it very carefully, step by step, and in a little while, a little bit later on, we will actually put on the website um, step by step instructions and a text, text document as well. Now, the installation, if you're doing it on a single Raspberry Pi, will take a reasonable amount of time because they are not the most powerful computers in the world, as you'll know. So what I've done is I've now got three Raspberry Pis and each one is at a different stage of the installation process. Um, this I hope will speed things up so as you're not actually standing there staring at the screen while we go through a nice long compiling session. Okay so we've got uh, three Raspberry Pis, each one at a different stage of the installation. Um, you can see I've actually tilted some of them up as well to keep them cool because when they're compiling they do get a little bit warm it does push the processor a little bit hard okay so what we're going to do is now just like in the first video you could use Windows and PuTTY in order to access your Raspberry Pis via SSH precisely how we did in the first video Although, uh, on this particular occasion, just for a bit of fun, we're going to use Linux instead. So I'm back to my familiar ground now, back on the Linux system. However, it's exactly the same thing. I could do precisely what I'm about to do purely by going to the Raspberry Pi's IP address using PuTTY in Windows, just like we did in the first video. Now, the very first thing I do need to do, and uh, hopefully, you know, if you're uh, not a Linux enthusiast or familiar with Linux, you'll learn a little bit of Linux as we're going along. Um, I'm in the terminal window. Uh, in fact I've got three terminal windows open. Um, this is one of the Pi's. This is another Pi which is part way through the installation process and this is another Pi which is getting toward the end of the installation process. Just to save time what I'm going to do is um, we don't have Angry IP Scanner on here so I'm going to show you a little trick. I'm going to become the root user on this uh, system. This is a Manjaro Linux system. So I'll tap in SU to switch user and the root user password, which hopefully I will type in correctly. Yep, we're in. Okay, I'll type CD to change to my currently logged in user's home directory. So I should now be in root. If I type PWD, I'm in root. That's where I'm located in the file system on this computer. If I type who am I, you can see I'm the root user. If I hit Control L, it will clear the screen. Now from a security perspective, everybody likes to do a little bit of security, so we'll use a nice security auditing tool, something called Nmap. And Nmap is a very, very powerful piece of software. It basically can do everything that Angry IP, can, IP Scanner can do, and much, much more. Um, this is a piece of software which actually was in a Hollywood film. I think it was the second of the Matrix trilogy films, where um, Trinity is just launched herself off of a tall building on a motorcycle and uh, landed in, uh, in an area where they have to go and uh, break in to see the architect if I remember correctly and they look over her shoulder in the next scene and she's actually using Nmap which is amazing because most Hollywood films they just make things up as they go along um, and this was a real piece of software which is quite interesting so I'm going to do an Nmap minus R minus SP and I'm going to tap in my home network which is on a 192.168.50.0 address range with a 255.255.255.0 subnet mask or slash 24 for those networkers amongst us. Um, minus R does a reverse DNS lookup. Um, minus SP will do what's known as a ping sweep so it will just go off and try to ping all of the computers that are actually up and running and alive on the network and try to do a reverse DNS lookup. So we'll give that a try, see what it says. It takes just a few seconds, it's pretty quick actually, and you can see that lots of things have replied back. Samsung Electronics, that's probably mobile phones, tablets, etc. 
what else have we got? B Sky B. That'll be the skybox then. Um, some Cisco kit. Loads and loads and loads of Raspberry Pis. Yes, I do have one or two Raspberry Pis knocking around. However, what we don't know is we don't know which ones of these are which. Now, I had to change the host name on my Pis. In the first video, you saw that I set them up as like N1, N2, N3. In fact, I think it was N3 that I set up in that demonstration. Didn't realize that the Raspberry Pis that I'm using to connect to the webcams to do the filming for these videos are also called N1, N2, N3, N4, and N5. So I actually had two host names identical on the uh, on the network, which wasn't a good idea. So I've changed the host names on these Pis to ND1, ND2, and ND3 just by editing the Etsy hosts and the Etsy hostname file uh, as was demonstrated in the step one video. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to run that again just for the hell of it because in a moment I'm going to use ARP. I'm going to look at the ARP cache. This is the address resolution protocol cache. Anybody who's done a little bit of Cisco will know all about this. It maps uh, a uh, known IP address to an unknown MAC address. So I'm going to do an ARP minus A and what this should do is this should give us the host names. <laughs> How clever is that? Okay, so I now know that ND1 local is on 70, ND2 is on 69, and ND3 is on 71. This is good. Well, I'm already in ND1 and ND2, so it's only ND3 that I really need to get into. And where was that located? Apparently it's on 71. Okay, so we should be able to we do a connectivity test. 192.168.50.71. That's very good. It does answer back. So there's somebody alive on there, as there should be, because Nmap found that address, and so did uh, it. Uh, the ARP cache also had it in it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to SSH into that address. Now, on the Windows machine, we had to install PuTTY. You can run PuTTY on a Linux machine as well. In fact. I open up PuTTY, you'll see, there you go, there's PuTTY running on a Linux machine. But we don't need to use PuTTY. Oh, no, no, no. We're on Linux now. Linux can do anything. So, Linux can SSH directly from the command line. So, SSH, the username, pi, at 192.168.50.71. I do accept the fingerprint, and I'll tap in the password, which I set to QWERTY just like in video one and you'll see I'm on a machine with a hostname of ND3 excellent if I want to double check that I can type hostname it says this hostname is ND3 so we're on ND3 node 3 node 1 node 2 so that's basically the uh, three Raspberry Pis now I don't know which way round they go um, I think that's ND3 <laughs> I think that's ND2 and that's ND1, but it doesn't really matter. But uh, we're on the three Raspberry Pis. ND2 is toward the end of the installation process. ND1 is about a third of the way through. And now on ND3 we'll show you how to start it all. Now I'm presuming that you've installed Raspbian, you've updated it, um, uh, you've changed the host name to whatever you want it to be, you've changed the default password precisely as we did in step one video. If you haven't looked at that I would suggest you go back and have a look at the step one video. Now what we're going to do is we're going to install free range routing. Now to do that we need to install some dependencies first so I will type in sudo su to become the root user. I'll we'll type cd to change to my root user's home directory. Control L just to clear the screen up, it makes it look nice and tidy and now we'll use the advanced package management tool or apt to install the dependencies that are required in order to get free range routing working okay so we'll apt install auto make bison etc 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 these are required software packages that must be in place in order for free range routing to work and we can install them as simply as typing apt install as I say, we will put the um, documentation with a file with all of these commands in and all the packages that you need to know to install up on the Open University Academy Support Centre website very shortly. 
you'll see we need to get five uh, we need to get 168 meg of archives that's compressed that's how they come over the internet and once they're uncompressed they'll take up 501 megabytes of space on the Raspberry Pi so without further ado because it does take a little while to download these there we go uh, this is the advanced package management tool downloading the software in compressed form it will then uncompress it and install it for us and as you can see it's working its way through the process of downloading the software I've got a reasonable internet connection here it's coming in on what's known as uh, VDSL which is a faster version of ADSL so it's coming over the telephone wires we don't have cable because I live in a little village and there is no cable so it comes in over the telephone wires it's a reasonably quick connection you can see that we've got um, just a little over 30 seconds to go before it's pulled all of the packages that are required however once it's pulled all those packages it then needs to uncompress them and install them and that takes a little while so I'll show you it uh, uncompressing and installing a few of the packages and then what we'll do is we'll switch to the other Pi where that process has finished and we can actually skip the rather slow and tedious extracting and installing of all of these software packages so you can see we're very nearly there, 90% there, 162 files downloaded the downloading is actually a lot faster than the extracting and the installation so it's pulled 168 meg in 1 minute and 20 seconds, that's pretty impressive and you can see now it's unpacking the packages and once it's unpacked all the packages it will install the packages we have a progress bar at the bottom now if you use the old commands apt get install you won't have the progress bar but if you use the new command which is just apt install apt space install you will get the progress bar and we like progress bars this takes a while this could take five to ten minutes so on the next tab on the other pie we literally have the end of that process all the packages are extracted and installed and what you'll see is once that's all done it will stop here okay this is good now at that point all we've done is we've installed the dependencies now it's a good idea to reboot the system at this point so I'm going to reboot in fact before I reboot I'm just going to check to see what the IP address is on this one so IPA show me the IP address, this is 50.70 on the wireless card WLAN 0 and now I will reboot the system there we go, it does actually tell me there when it says the connection's closed so what I'll do is I will ping have we got a ping on here somewhere? <laughs> no that would be far too easy Kev so I will ping 192.168.50. 7.0 and just wait for that Raspberry Pi to reboot. The lovely thing about these Raspberry Pis, especially when you have the cut down version of Raspbian, Buster Lite, they reboot very very fast. It's already there. Okay, so that's now answering, which means I can now SSH back into the Raspberry Pi. SSH is the Pi user at 192.168.50.70. Tap on his password, QWERTY, and we're ready to go. So this Raspberry Pi has had the operating system installed, it's been updated, we've changed the host name to what we wish it to be, we've changed the default password, we've now just installed all of the dependencies required to get FFR routing working, and the next job we need to do is to create some system users and groups. So what we'll do is we'll become the root user, sudo su, um, I'll just type CD and Control L, clear the screen a little bit. We need to create some system users and groups. I've got all of this in a Word doc, which I will post up on the website, so as you can very quickly tap these commands in. We're going to add a couple of groups. Okay, we're at an FFR group and an FFR VTY group. Okay, that's done and then what we will do is we'll add some more make some more modifications okay that's good we've created the home directory now so these are groups and home directories that are required for FFR to root 
Um, we will now do a reboot. Probably don't need to do a reboot at this stage, but like I say, it's so fast. Now if I hit the up arrow, we do have a ping, 50.70. Let's see how quickly this little Pi reboots. I would say probably about 10 seconds has passed since I hit the reboot. Uh, I would say that's probably going to be back up in less than 30 seconds, which is pretty impressive. Okay, that's about 20 seconds, and we're back. Well, perhaps a little over 20 seconds. Okay, we'll SSH back into the Pi again. Tap in our password, which we set to QWERTY. Not a great password, but useful if you're wanting to install things quickly. Uh, we'll do a sudo. Do we need to do a sudo issue? No, we don't. Hold on. As the normal user, so if I do a who am I, I can see which user I'm logged in as. I'm use, logged in as the user Pi, because I logged in via SSH as the user Pi. Now comes the fun part. Now we're going to go off and we're going to get the FF the FRR routing software. But we're going to get the very latest development version. We're going to use something called Git. What a wonderful, wonderful name that is. Git. We're going to do a Git clone of the GitHub site for FF routing. And that will pull the latest version of the software. Okay, and it will drop it into a um, specified directory. So Git clone, there's the address. That's the directory we're going to drop it into. And then this space and and means once you've done this part, run this part. So the and and allows us to string a couple of commands together. So it'll do this part first. It'll git clone um, the software into the FRR folder. And then it will change directory to the FRR folder. So what we should see happening is we should see it cloning into the FRR folder. And it's pulling the software. This is the very, very latest development version of free range routing. That command will always pull the latest version that's up there. And you can see it's receiving the objects. Not the fastest download in the world, but it's not having to pull a great deal of software. FRR is quite a small piece of software. And once it's pulled that software and put it into the FRR folder, successfully it will then change directories to that folder and we should see ourselves in the FRR folder. Okay, I'm just keeping talking now whilst it's uh, doing its job. It's nearly there, it's pulled a 43 meg, 44 meg, 45 meg. I think it's somewhere around about sort of 70 or 75 meg in total. Around that mark, perhaps a little less. Oh, 59 meg, there we go. Resolving deltas, any changes and things like that, and it's almost there. This is actually a relatively quick bit. <laughs> this is this is a task that does take a little while to do, but it's worth it. Um, and you will see that we have actually changed directory into the FRR folder. You can see from the prompt. And if I type PWD, you see we're in HomePy FRR now. Okay, now. If I want to look in that folder, I can do an ls. We can see there's various things in there, including this file here, bootstrap.sh. We will run that file. So dot forward slash bootstrap.sh. It looks like nothing's happening for a little while, but this is actually preparing now for us to compile the software. Now, if you were to go back in the world of Linux, quite a number of years compiling software was where it's at. Almost all software was compiled initially when Linux first came out before the package managers and the package management tools made life an awful lot easier. Because this is very leading edge software we will actually need to compile it. So bootstrap.sh is preparing the software ready to be compiled in that directory. So almost there. It's making uh, setting up the make file and various bits and pieces like that. So there we go. Done. Now, again, the next command is absolutely huge, which is why I've put it in a Word doc to save you having to remember this. You'd never remember this command. Okay, we're going to do dot forward slash configure. 
this configures the software ready to be made and installed onto the system. Um, what we have is following that is we have various flags, um, various options. So where we put um, different files, for instance, the system binary directory, the system configuration directory goes in etcffr and things like that. Um, believe me, it took a lot of figuring out to work out how to do this. <laughs> I got no, I don't know, about 30 times I think I installed Raspbian in order to get this working properly. Okay, so now we do the compile. Now, in fairness, the compile doesn't take a huge amount of time. It's the step that follows the compile, which is the make, that takes a very long time. So the third Raspberry Pi has already had the make stage done, and we can switch over to that shortly, and that will save us a bit of time. So what it's doing now is compiling the software, and you can see it's checking to make sure various um, pieces of software, uh, dependencies, um, links and various things like that are in place and uh, correctly configured. Um, if any one of these failed, um, it would normally give you an error which, once you get used to it, you can genu gen generally understand these errors, 9 times out of 10, once you're used to it it will give you some idea of what's missing. It's normally a dependency that's missing. However, we were very careful to install the dependencies a few steps back, so there should be no missing dependencies. That's good. That's done it fine. Okay, so the software is now compiled, and you can see various things like, for instance, um, the user that it's run as, um, various uh, permissions uh, on here, um, network in a box version, there we go, uh, that's all ready to go. Now, the next step takes a very long time. Make. Okay. And believe me, uh, at this point you can go and uh, make yourself a sandwich, and make yourself a nice cup of coffee, um, go and walk the dog, pop next door to your neighbour, walk their dog. Um, it, it takes somewhere in the region of 20-25 minutes. So definitely once you get to this stage have a little break, have a coffee, put your feet up. Um, once it's compiled it should make perfectly well. Um, the key thing is to make sure the dependencies are in place. So you can see it's now compiling various modules. Um, some of these a little bit later on will be very recognizable things like RIP, BGP, OSPF etc. Um, static routes. I'm not going to bore you to death by leaving you to watch this for the next 25 minutes. So we'll now move on to Raspberry Pi number 3, which cunningly is at the very end of that process. So the make has now been done. And after the make has been done, we need to run the command make install. However, to do a make install, you have to be the root user. So on the Raspberry system, we'll just put sudo in front and that will allow us to run this command as the root user. The root user has permission to literally install software, to go into directories and install software, that's why you need to be the, make, the uh, root user. So we'll do a sudo make install. Um, if we look up, the previous command was make, the one before that was configure, the one before that was bootstrap. So we've done those, we've finished the make, we now do the make install. And you cross your fingers. It should work fine. I've spent quite a number of days in getting this uh, tested and <laughs> working. Uh, yep, that's fine. There's no errors present there. Um, believe me, once you've done enough Linux, you can look at that and you can think, oh, thank goodness, yeah, that worked okay. Okay, so it has made the software. And it's installed the software and we're very nearly there now. Okay, So, what we now do is we need to create some folders with various permissions on for the different types of routing protocols. Again, this will be in the text document so you can simply copy and paste it in. Uh, unsafe paste. Paste anyway. There we go. 
Okay, this is actually creating directories with the correct permissions for the correct users and the correct groups. Um, you could notice some, uh, if you've done any networking, BGP, OSPF, OSPF, IPv6, intermediate system, intermediate system, root and information protocol, protocol independent multicast. Wow, how about that, eh? Um, next top redundancy protocol. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. And if you're into networking, there's some very clever stuff that you can do on a Raspberry Pi. Now, we now need to make sure that the Pi itself will forward packets between interfaces. It's not a lot of good having a router if you cannot forward packets between interfaces. So we'll become the root user, sudo su. If you've not used Linux before, you are learning an awful lot of Linux right now. Yes, it probably is a bit confusing to start off with. However, um, that's the great thing about recording is you can have a little look at the recording and spend some time trying to digest the Linux magic that's going on. So we'll use Nano, which is a text editor, and we need to edit the file um, etc, it's in the etsy folder, sysctl config. Okay, and in that file we need to look for the line that allows IPv4 packets to be forwarded between interfaces, which is that one. That line there, it has a hash in front of it, which means it's going to be ignored. We need to remove the hash. Okay, now it will be used. So, net IPv4 IP forward equals 1. That says forward IP packets between interfaces. In other words, we can route from one network to another. We'll do the same thing for IPv6 packets. Only change those two lines, nothing else. Okay, we'll do a control O to write and then enter, keeping the default name etcctl.conf. Do a control X to exit. And at this stage, we'll do a reboot. And we are very nearly finished. It's very close now. So we'll do a systemctl reboot. This is on 5069. We are very, very nearly finished now. There's only a few more things to do. And they're very fast things as well, thankfully. So what we'll do is we'll ping that address to see when it comes back up. It's probably back up already. Not quite. Now it is. Okay. Then we'll SSH into that address as the Pi user. Tap in the Pi user's password of QWERTY. Boom, boom, boom. And now, what have we got to do now? There's just a few important configuration files we need to have a little look at now. Um, first things first, we'll need to be the root user. So we'll do a sudo su. We're going to do a cd just to tidy things up and a control L. cd just changes to your currently logged in user's home directory, but it makes the prompt a little bit shorter. So it's just tidy for the screen. Um, we need to put the line service integrated vtysh.config into the etc frr vtysh config file. We can do that like this. So it echoes service integrated blah 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 into the file vtysh.config which lives in etcffr. Oh, you'd be Linux Jedi's by the end of this. And then once that's done, we will use nano to create the daemons file um, in etcfrr. So this is a file that doesn't exist, so nano will actually create this file for us. Nano being a command line text editor. So etcffr daemons. It's a blank file, as you can see. And then in that file, we will simply paste in the daemons, or in other words, the services that we wish free range routing to run. Uh, yes, we do want to paste that. Okay, Zebra is very important because Zebra is the main routing engine for FFR, and then you can select which routing protocols you wish to run. Um, I just put the, I could probably put BGP on as well, but for the moment I'll just put OSPF and uh, RIP for v4 and EIGRP for v4 on here. I want static routing. 
Okay, so you can see how that works. If you want to put BGP on, you can just type yes instead of no by the side of BGPD. Okay, so that will actually allow FFR when it loads up to know which uh, routing protocols it needs to enable services for. Control O, Enter, Control X. You wouldn't believe how close we are to finishing now. Um, now we need to do the daemons.conf file, which is the configuration file for those daemons. So again, we'll nano that. It's another brand new file that we're creating. And in there, we need to paste another block of code. Paste. Okay, 30 minutes. That's not too bad considering this is a very advanced Linux installation. But if you take it step by step and are very careful with doing it, and like I say, we'll put a step by step document up on how to do this, you shouldn't have any problems. Okay, Control O, Enter, Control X. It is tricky to install FRR, but once it's running, it's super easy to use. And if you've done any Cisco, um, it's just so similar um, to using a Cisco router. It's remarkable. Okay, now the uh, last step before we do the final reboot, and this is absolutely critical. Do not forget to do this. If you forget to do this, it simply will not work. Okay, it's very easy to miss this. This is actually the bit that messed me up for about two hours when I was trying to get this working. We need to echo. Um, a uh, file uh, into um, folder. So what we're doing is we we we're, we're then running ld config to just update that. Uh, so here we go. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Linux magic. Linux magic. It's installed. FFR is now installed. We'll do the final reboot, and then we should be able to log into your Raspberry Pi router. Wow. I'll we'll do a ping, wait for the machine to come up and start replying to those uh, ping packets. Once it replies to the ping packets, we know it's there and listening, and we can connect via SSH. Breathe a sigh of relief. SSH in, QWERTY. This router is now, sorry, this Pi is, is now a router. Okay. Um, in order to start FFR, you need to be the root user. So we'll do a sudo su to become the root user. And then it's simply a matter of typing forward slash user, USR, that is, forward slash lib FFR. FRR, FRR, start. Okay, and now that should run. Okay, it's running. All we need to do now is to connect to the router. And to connect to the router, we run the command VTYSH. And there we are. We're on a router. Don't believe me? Let's do a show run. Alright, there's not much of a running config there at the moment. We've got a hostname of ND2, which is pulled from the hostname anyway of the system. Um, however, if we do a conf t, we can drop into global configuration mode. We do a question mark to see what we've got in global configuration mode. There's a lot of stuff on there. Um, let's um, look at uh, what routing protocols we've got. Babel. Yep, <laughs> you wouldn't have heard of Babel. That's a, that's, a, that's a bit of a special one. Open Fabric. Yep, there's some really clever stuff on here. And we've got BGP, EIGRP, OSPF, OSPF version 6, RIP, RIP NG, uh, RIP for v IPv6. Um, if we do a OSPF, root for OSPF, question mark. And uh, it's, it's all there. <laughs> it's all there. Okay. Um, do a show interface. 
brief. Now it's not show IP interface brief, it's show interface brief. So that'll confuse a few Cisco people. It's not show IP interface brief, it's just show interface brief. And you can see we've got three interfaces, Ethernet 0, the loopback and WLAN 0. The WLAN 0 does have an IP address on, Ethernet 0 interface does not. If we connected it to a switch it would go off and try to get one via DHCP. So by default the Linux Etsy network interface file, um, DHCPD client daemon, to be precise, will try to get an IP address via DHCP. Now there's a way of stopping that, but I'll show you that in another video. It's a good idea to stop that on all the interfaces apart from the one you're SSHing on, because that gives you a behaviour much more like a normal Cisco router, where the interface is down until you manually bring it up. Okay, so um, oh, what can we do? What can we do? Show IP root. That looks a bit different. That's so what you got. You got your kernel routes. You see, there's a default route there. Directly connected routes. Um, see I'm not sure because the interface isn't plugged into a switch but if we go into interface Ethernet 0 and we do an IP address it probably won't work because it's not actually plugged into a switch but we can give it a try Partly because it's not plugged into a switch. Let's have a little look. Oh, we know why. <laughs> this will this will throw you. This will throw you. Right. One nine two dot one six eight dot ten dot. Well, I don't know. Two five four slash twenty four. Yeah. That's why I didn't like it before. It's because I put the old-fashioned longhand style subnet mask in. It doesn't use those uses VLS, uh, the uh, CIDR prefix slash 24 which is rather nice. No shutdown. Now I'm not sure whether that's uh, taken it or not because like I say it's not plugged into a switch. Ah, it's got it on there and it's saying it's up so if we plugged it into a switch now we should be good to go. Um, yeah, It doesn't show up in the routing table that's because it's not actually physically up because it's not plugged into a switch. Okay, so you can see um, uh, right. the only reason we got an error there is because it's the first time it's created it. Um, you notice the second time we run it the uh, error disappeared. Yep, so um, and it won't it, it won't it won't show up again uh, because uh, it knows it's there now. Yeah. So the first time you create that file, you will get that thing where it says error. That's no problem. Just run it again, and you're away. There you go. Um, show startup config. There's nothing in the startup config. Show running config. There's not a lot in the running config actually. There. Rooter OSPF. Rooter OSPF. Let's put something in there. Uh, let's put the OSPF root right in. Um, Passive interface. Um, actually, I think it literally is. Is it? Is it OSPF? Yeah, OSPF router ID. So some commands are very slightly different. Uh, yeah. Now if I do a uh, exit, oops, yeah. and do a show run, show run. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Um, if you type exit again, it will exit from the FFR routing engine. And um, in order to stop FFR, goes without saying, user lib FFR FFR stop, bang, and that will stop FFR. Yeah. <laughs> It's one for a rainy day, this one. But I tell you what, it's worth it. You will learn so much about Linux and networking in general. And not only that, you can have the coolness of actually having a full-blown router running on a Raspberry Pi. How about that? Um, what we'll do is I'll do another video 
in a little while, give it a little bit of a break for a short time and then I'll do another video on how we can use three of these Raspberry Pi routers connected together to do a Cisco type, CCNA2 type uh, routing lab. Not sure whether it will be OSPF, EIGRP, BGP um, or RIP or some combination thereof. Um, oh, yes. Yes, good idea. I could use ISIS. No, don't use ISIS anymore um, in the CCNA. So, intermediate system, intermediate system is uh, not in use. Um, multi -year area OSPF could do that. Uh. Okay, so we now have a Raspberry Pi router. Um, I hope you found that useful. As I said, it's not a trivial installation. There's an awful lot of Linux in there. However, um, we'll put the um, text document up so as you can copy along and um, basically copy and paste to uh, build the system. Um, and um, you may well need to look at this video more than once. Um, but uh, I hope you found it useful and I will see you again for video number three where we can do a routing lab using routers built with Raspberry Pis. Thanks very much for watching.